Hello everyone, this is the first episode of Spilled Theory, and I'm Jeff Nichter. The idea for this podcast came about because I started learning guitar because of Built to Spill about 13 years ago, and so maybe you did too, maybe you haven't yet started playing it, but I figured if you're here because you like Built to Spill music, we could talk about the way those songs are made and learn how to be better guitar players, better songwriters, better musicians, and possibly learn a new appreciation of the music. Something that I want to talk about early on is the role of music theory. Many people see music theory like a map of a city of where you can go, not necessarily where you should go or how to make music. Descriptive, not prescriptive. And what I mean by that is that look at patterns in music that you like and analyze those patterns to recreate it or imitate it. What makes music interesting is a mechanic of tension and release. And that comes from setting up expectations, sometimes meeting them, and sometimes surprising the listener. Today we're going to be looking at the first song on the album, Keep It Like a Secret, The Plan. So the first thing we'll look at when we, when we look at a song is the key of the song. The plan happens to be in the key of D. D is the home, the tonic of the song. And so every time we return to the note and chord D major, it sounds very stable. It sounds like home. It sounds like the beginning, the end, and where you come back to. It's where we'll go when we want to resolve tension. And so to start off the song, Doug or Jim, when they're playing it live, starts with a slide from the second fret on the high E string, which is an F sharp. And he slides up to the fifth fret on the high E string, which is an A. I will be sharing the tabs for all of this uh, to follow along. A small detail is that on the studio recording, there is a strummed acoustic part, very subtle. It's on the left channel, and if you listen to it next time, you might notice it. So during that, we are strumming the D chord, and then as the vocals enter, we move to the G chord to build tension, and then it resolves to the D chord. To increase the impact of that resolution, we have both the crash cymbal and the D chord hitting on beat two. And so what that means, we're counting in one, two, three, four. And so we expect that the strongest beat will be one, right at the beginning, one, two, three, four. But instead it goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And so that delayed expectation really has a impact on this part of the song. And while we hold that D chord, Brett has the bass part moving downward to create motion. And then it goes back up and has like an anthem feeling. And so to build extra tension, we have the two dissonant notes, F sharp and E, played so that they ring out on the B and G strings, which then is resolved on that beat two returning back to the D. And so during this part of the song, we're basically rotating between the chords D and G. And if you're following along on piano, notes in D would be D, F sharp, and A. And the notes in G would be G, B, and D. One way that might be analyzed, especially uh, people with a jazz theory background, they might think of it as a G major 7 chord, which is G, B, D, and F sharp. And then that F sharp going back down to the E. And after that point, we go to a little figure which is played in octaves. And so octaves, by the way, can be found in a number of different positions, but on the bottom four strings, the way to play them is they are two frets apart and three strings apart. And Doug uses this technique of octaves a lot. The effect of this is that it sounds bigger and more full and it almost sounds like there could be two guitar players playing at once. It, uh, it really fills out the sound. And so he uses that to great effect here when he's playing on the 12th fret. And then we repeat that figure, uh, making it slightly different. And in music composition class, this might be called antecedent and consequent phrases. And what that means is, so there's a first phrase that is like a question. It doesn't completely resolve. And then there's another one that's similar, 
but it ends on a more resolved note. And so that's phrase one. And this is phrase two. And that's the end. After that, Doug goes back down to the D chord and he uh, does what's called the suspension. This is a common sound in classic rock. Uh, I think of James Taylor as doing this a lot. Uh, Neil Young probably does a lot too. And what you do is, so you play the D chord and then you suspend it by playing on the high E string, the third fret. You can lift up on your middle finger and allow the E string to ring out. Those are called sus fours and sus two. And what that basically means is that you're playing the third of the chord, but then you're going up to the fourth note in the scale or back down to the second note. And that movement from three to four or two to three and back, that, that's all just kind of movement around the same chord. After that, we come to a section that I'm tempted to call the bridge because it's the first significantly different part of the song. We modulate down to C. And what that means is that our key center goes from D where it had been, so D feels like home, to C feeling like home. And the effect that has on the song, uh, a lot of times in pop songs, you'll hear a modulation up a whole step and it, it's, it feels like a big breakthrough. It feels like a really happy moment to introduce a new energy, a new movement to the song. And so a couple famous examples that I first think of and I think everybody probably knows is Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror. Uh, about three quarters of the way through the song, it modulates half a step up and it really brightens it up, makes it feel happier. And another example is Beyonce's Love on Top, which is a whole step modulation. And the songwriters on that song use it in a similar way to lift the song. And so what this does in the plan is it feels like the opposite. Everything is hopeless and uh, everything's falling apart. It sounds brutal and harsh and surprising. I kind of call this the machine gun bridge because what the snare drum and the guitars are doing has that really rhythmic, aggressive attack sort of sound. One important thing to note is the process behind making the album. And evidently how it worked was Doug, Scott, the drummer, and Brett, with an L, the bass player, uh, were jamming and were finding different parts and they were switching instruments a lot. And so it's important to realize that some of the ideas that have ended up in the final song came from the collaboration between them. On the studio version of the song, we have a tremolo guitar part on the right channel, which further adds sort of like a psychedelic and disoriented feeling to the abrasiveness of this section. At the end of the section, we come to a line or a guitar solo that almost has like a scary or Halloween sort of sound. And I was looking into why exactly that is and where it comes from. And the best answer I could come up with is that it uses the major diminished scale. The notes that it uses are B, D, F, and F sharp. And so you might notice that those are built around the B diminished chord, which is B, D natural, and F natural. And so a B major chord would be B, D sharp, and F sharp. And a diminished chord occurs naturally when it's the seventh in the C scale. Diminished and augmented scales and chords give you some of the most tension that you can find besides uh, other combinations of chords that give you even more dissonance. Uh, and I was trying to look for examples where you can hear this in other songs and some that I found and, and friends suggested to me were Paranoid Android by Radiohead and the Twilight Zone theme. They both use similar scales for a similar feeling. And by the end of the song, we return back into the pattern of going between the D and the G chords. And that feels so much more familiar and pleasant to go back to after some of the some of the tension and dissonance that came from before. In the live version of the song, which shows up 
on their live album and on the reverb performance. Doug really stretches out this part of the song with an extended solo. And the notes that he's using are, are typical of the D major scale, but he's really expressive with the rhythm and he uses contrast to make things interesting. He's expressive with the tempo. Sometimes he slows down and pushes and pulls against the tempo. It sounds so much more confident and nostalgic to me, the way the band plays. It is sort of a, a really reaffirming feeling that we are built to spill. We have always been. Uh, you've heard our songs, and this is, this is us doing what we do. If you're a gear person like I am, you might also be interested in some of the gear that makes this song work the way that it does. Doug plays mainly a Stratocaster. It's a Strat Plus from the late 80s, which has lace sensor pickups. They're noiseless. They sound a lot like 50s style pickups, which means they're kind of bell-like a little bit compressed, uh, very clean. But it looks like Brett is using a jazz style bass. He also uses the tremolo a fair bit. He'll pull upwards on it to raise the pitch. Do that sometimes when strumming or playing octaves. And it gives it a certain wobbly feeling. And you'll notice that on this song live, in the on the live album, Jim is playing a Stratocaster with the tremolo as well. That's another Stratocaster sound with the wobbly pitch. Another part that goes into Doug's sound is, according to my research, most albums and on the live album, he's playing a Fender Bassman, which is a classic, very thick, very full. Some might argue it's one of the best sounding amps ever. So good that Marshall started their company by copying it in England. There's also mentions of the Fender Tweed Deluxe, the 5e3 amp and the fender deluxe reverb there's a good possibility he might have played a fender twin on there's nothing wrong with love but all this gear talk might be a good topic for another episode and then he plays the dan electro daddio overdrive which is a copy of the marshall governor into that for his uh, overdrive pedal live during this time and uh, as a guitar player who's looked up to Doug all these years for his playing, the way that I would describe his strengths, what makes him different as a player, is he has really great phrasing. And so the notes that go together really smoothly and well, and he'll, he'll play a lot of kind of scalar lines, so notes together, notes near each other, they're not jumping around a ton. And he, he does a lot of like compositional phrasing that I think is really impressive and, and you don't see that too much outside of players like Neil Young or Jay Maskus. And so I want to finish by personally thanking Built to Spill for their music over the years and, and how great it is to be one of the fans. I would love to have guests on future episodes, especially bass players, drummers, other guitar players, songwriters, people who have been inspired by Built to Spill's music and have learned, and we could talk about specifically what you've learned. And it would be more than amazing to have past members of Built to Spill talk about their memories and stories behind the music and their careers. To have producers like Phil Eck, Sam Coombs, Dave Trumfio, Stephen Ray Lobdo talk about the process of recording the albums that we all know. If anyone has connections to them, we could use Skype, Zoom, Discord, an old-fashioned phone call. 
If you enjoy this episode and you want more music theory right now, there's a number of places you can go for that. I will link them in the show notes. It's a great place to talk about learning music. I'll be linking to some of the projects that the past members have been part of as a way to support them. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do that too. Be sure to join the Reddit community, the subreddit Built to Spill, and the Facebook community Built to Spillin'. If you liked it, tell your friends about it. Uh, You're welcome to give me feedback. I'll take it to heart and see what I can do to improve it and give it a rating on Apple Music. My plan is to make this a bi-weekly podcast as long as I am furloughed and quarantined. Uh, I am working on a few other little projects here and there, releasing them on Wednesdays. They'll be available on all the major podcast platforms. There will be a YouTube video component. There will be a Bandcamp page that you can support if you'd like this to be a continuing thing. The tab for this song will be available on the subreddit, on the Facebook page, and the solo that I tabbed pretty meticulously is available on the Bandcamp page as a bonus item. I hope this podcast finds you healthy and on the verge of a positive new year. One concept that I'd like to try out is ending each episode by introducing everyone to a band that sounds like and was inspired by Built to Spill. This is a band from Arkansas called The Formals with the song I Shoulda Tried Harder. This has been Spilled Theory. Thanks. Thanks.